Hello class. Um, today we're going to be looking at pre-Columbian America, which re, you know basically means America before the arrival of Europeans, before Columbus. One thing we ha we have to be cognizant of as we look through, you know, go through this PowerPoint is is realize that what we're looking at and what we we're seeing and studying is we're inferring from what we know. Um, there are probably hundreds or more tribes that we will never know. Um, when Europeans set foot on this continent, over 90% of the population is wiped out by disease. And that disease sometimes made its way to the Native Americans even before they even saw a European through vast trade networks. So what we're piecing together and what we're seeing and we're taking from world traditions and so forth is what is left. So America is probably even more occupied than we can you know, verify at this moment. Now, um, when we look at tribes, or when we look at regions, we must understand that, um, you know, geography dictates how you live and where you live and, you know, customs and cultures, you know, are, are developed from geography. So we can look at different parts of America because America has vast geographies from mountains to deserts to river valleys and so forth. So we can look at the Appalachia, the Rocky Mountains, the Mississippi River, uh, Missouri, Arkansas, Red Rivers, the Great Plains. Uh, the Great Basin region, and so um, different people settled in different places and created different types of communities, and like I said, geography dictates where and how they lived. And so um, looking at a map here, you can see, you know, um, the different regions of America. Um, one thing to also point out um, is what I, what I found fascinating in studying history was how maps can be used by different people. Now, um, we'll learn later that the Dutch, the French, the Spanish, you know, produced maps, but their maps didn't look anything like the, you know, the British and the American maps. Their maps actually highlighted on, on the map where different tribes live, their different regions and so forth. But for the British and later America, most maps produced look like this. And they didn't have any named tribes there because what they were trying to advertise was the land was open and free for the taking. Now, like I mentioned before, um, the term pre-Columbian means before um, Europeans set foot on, on the continents. And then post-Columbian, of course, is afterwards. So, you know, we have those two major time periods. And these are major time periods because pre-Columbian time, you know, is different in both the old and new world because the discovery of the new world, you know, set off changes in the old world as well. So it's a big, you know, time stamp to be looking at. And of course, post-Columbian is a time period that, you know, we're, we're gonna study more and more. It is a time after um, Columbus set foot in the, you know, on the Americas. Um, we can look, uh, historians love to put things into time periods. So, you know, we, we look at settlements in very different ages, like the Paleolithic, Archaic, Woodland, Middle, and Mississippian period. Um, we look at the Ice Age, which was a part of time period in which a lot of most of the, of the world was covered in ice. And this led to different um, land formations and, and um, also people's movements. Now, um, looking at this map, you can see here, um, we're looking at um, migrations of over what they call the, the Bering Straits, and this is because the Bering Strait was frozen. But with new technologies, especially DNA, we're getting a very different picture of how people got here and the fact that maybe some people have been here longer or forever. Um, what, the reason this is, is uh, um, there's some members of tribes that they've been tested that have DNA that's very distinct and cannot be found anywhere else but in the Americas. So we're still in, you know, figuring out you know, the actual prehistory of the Americas. Now you can look on the map on the right and see different routes that different people took also to get here, which you know is all part of the whole story. Some people may or may not have been already here, and many others came from different parts of the world. And you know, some came in, in very easy trips when when the Bering Strait was frozen over during the Ice Age, people walked definitely walked over it. But we also know that people were here before that ice bridge was there. Um, if you look on the right of the map, you'll see how Scandinavians, which are the, some, of, some of the first Europeans that got here, could have easily made a hop, skip, and a jump from Greenland, Iceland, to Canada. And we find their settlements in northern Canada. Um, you can see other types of, um, there's even theories that Asians made their way around, over, and also Polynesians. 
And Polynesians tell an interesting story when we look at like um, how they may have migrated to the Americas. And I mean, Polynesians are like the people that occupy Hawaii, which is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And you begin to ask questions is like, how'd they get that far? And if they could get that far, they definitely could have made it all the way to the Americas. And when asked about this, because there, you know, there's no other way, but maybe it, oral tradition is how did you, you know, reach these islands so far out and then possibly could have reached America. And they had a really simple answer. And that was, we followed the birds. The birds had to land somewhere, so there definitely was land in that direction, so they followed the birds, and that's how they discovered different lands, different islands, and so forth. Now, Pale Paleolithic age is the early age of man. We start to see um, la larger settlements. We start to see the use of tools and more advanced tools as we start looking, you know, from stone knives to spears, bows and arrows, javelins, and not lots. And, you know, we refer to as Clovis points, the type of um, um, points that you see there in those images at the very bottom corner. Um, we also see, um, one thing you have to understand about Native Americans is too often when I use that word, indigenous people or even Indians, you get a certain image in your, in your head. And what you have to understand is that image in your head is a white European idea of what Native Americans are. And that's not necessarily what a Native American is. What you're probably seeing is an amalgamation of a whole bunch of different tribes just slammed together. What we have to understand is these people had very distinct cultures, very distinct languages and ways of living and so forth. And we group them into major languages like Algonquin, Iroquoian, Muskegon, you know, Suin and Uto Itza, Aztecan. But you have to understand within those groups, there's huge families of languages. It's like saying, you know, Latin is a group in which there's like, you know, there's Spanish, there's French. And so um, Ger German definitely gives birth to English, but none of those la languages sound, you know, very similar. And you certainly couldn't, without any education, speak, you know, understand either of those languages, even if you spoke one of them. So um, when we look at Native Americans, it's not one, you know, type of language or even five. There's language groups, but in those groups, those languages are very distinct and they get developed throughout time, depending on regions and so forth. But I've always found fascinating is how they were still able to communicate with each other. Sometimes through simple words, but a lot of times through sign language. When we look at the archaic age, we start to see larger settlement communities, evidence of people settling in larger numbers in different areas, the development of horticulture, development of the the very crops that will sustain them, like squash, gourd, pumpkin, sunflower, bean, maize, and so forth. Um, one thing that was really interesting about corn is corn is one of the first genetically engineered um, um, crops ever. By ancient peoples, corn used to be some, um, the size of a thumb, and they would they slowly picked and depicted different ones and seeded different ones till they made corn the size that it is today. Now, one thing about the Americas is there were very few what we would call domesticated animals or animals they could use, you know, um, unlike in Europe. So one of the main, main um, you like what we call pack animals was the dog. Um, and then as a, as a ready food source that was sometimes kept almost like chickens was turkey. Um, now, during the woodland periods, we start to see... Um, more distinct cultures and civilizations grow, grouping up in different places like Great Lake region or the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we, some of the earliest cultures are the Adina, the Hopewell, and they build these large mounds that we can now see through like sat satellite imagery and stuff. Where we can see that these weren't um, things out of nature. These were man-made structures that were made to look like animals or different designs. And you can see some of those designs there on those images there. And you can see some of the remnants of their settlements also there. In the middle period, we have the Hohokam. Um, we're looking at the Southwest around Arizona and stuff. The Hohokam, much like the Mayan at a certain point in time, just um, mysteriously die out. We see evidence of cannibalism, which tells us that there were probably um, a lack of resources. You're looking at a very dry climate. Maybe at one time it was a rainier period where there was easier access to water and they were able to establish a community, but then you know, probably a drought period of drought came about and those people left. Another um, interesting group that always lends itself to um, 
conspiracy theories of the Anasazi, who move into the same kind of area, build these huge complexes into the sides of cliffs and mesas. Um, these are like, you know, they look like huge apartment complexes, four or five, six stories high. You know, we wouldn't see building like this, to, you know, for into the 1800s. And um, these people had a huge complex civilization. Um, and one, one thing about them is that at a certain period of time, kind of like the Hohokam, they just disappear. And they've been the subject for many a conspiracy theory as to where they went or what happened. Um, what we believe today is they probably, through you know lack of resources, may have led to warfare, starvation, whatever. But at a certain point, they felt it was better to break up and leave and go somewhere with better resources. Here you can see some of the images of what I'm talking about. Um, you can see some of these big circular objects. They were to collect water. Um, you can see on the bottom left corner what their civilization probably looked like in its height. And we can see different tools, different pieces of jewelry, you know, that these people wore. And um, all this is found in these settlements that were just, you know, abandoned at a certain point in history. Um, in the Mississippian period, we see more settlement along the Mississippi. The Mississippi is huge, runs, you know, you know, right down the middle of the United States. It's a, it's a huge river. So, you know, it was a good place to settle, to have access to water. Um, we see the use of tobacco as currency, but also tobacco as part of a religious process. Tobacco for Native Americans was, in a sense, sending the smoke was going up into the sky to send prayers to God, to the Great Spirit. They had different names, but most of them were monotheistic. And um, so when they were their smoking was a prayer to God. And which is why sometimes if you see some of those old Westerns, they'll get hand over the peace pipe coin, let's smoke the pipe and be no, there'll be no lies between us because you wouldn't lie to God. And here's sir, um, some of their um, architecture and building. And what you can look at is the size of these pyramids and very, very um, similar to the ones you see in, in Egypt. Um, I always found fascinating how we all, you know, people, um, humans build things almost the same way, using the same designs and styles. And the pyramids are a really good example. Now, a lot of times we didn't, you know, you may not have known that these existed because they're made out of what was around. So a lot of these were earthen mounds. So they either, you know, were destroyed by nature or just over covered with foliage and we're just barely finding out these structures exist through archaeology. And here you can see some of the remnants of pottery and so forth and their, and their dress. <laughs> Now, like I said, geography dictates where they lived and how they lived. So, like, you, you know, in places there was easy access to water, where the, the climate wasn't so dry. You have huge agricult agricultural regions. And other places, you know, in the agricultural regions, you actually had larger groups living in one place. But other places, you had smaller groups because that's all they can sustain themselves, either through hunter-gathering so, so, or so some of the mix of agriculture and hunting. On the coast, of course, you could have fishing to supplement or become the mainstay of life. You know, in, in the Southwest, you had a mixture also of hunter-gathering, horticulture, and so forth, depending on the access to water. And of course, the subarctic, you have fishing, you have um, hunting, um, and whatever they could, you know, use, and then find, they found ways to preserve so they could survive through these harsh winters. Now, to me, one of the most ingenious peoples are the Inuit, those that you refer to as Eskimos. Um, these guys found a way to live in an area with, you know, it drops to like 60 below. And somehow these people designed, created homes, created clothing to allow them to survive in such a harsh environment. And here um, you can see the use of the igloo, you know, using ice to stay warm. It almost seems counterintuitive. Um, you see the use of the kayaks that can get through these little streams that would appear throughout cracks in the ice. Um, they used, um, you know, dogs to help push them around, push supplies. Here you can see your outfit there. And then you can see one of their um, homes that's built into the earth. Now, I, like I said, I just want to refer to the fact that um, I mentioned earlier that Native Americans are, you know, very distinct and different and look different and dress different and talk different. And we need to dispel that image that pops in your head when you think Native Americans. It's not like one group, one society. It's like Africa is a continent. It's not, you know, a specific group of people that all, you know, 
spoke the same language or practiced the same thing. There were many different governments there and different cultures. Same thing with the Americas. Now you, um, the Northwest Coast Indians, you see moving uh, up, you know, um, in, in, into Canada and stuff like that. They also had a very distinct society. They lived in wooden homes, long plank homes. They also built totems, which is really interesting because then you see totems everywhere. So in you know, all those different cultures, but really it was only certain cultures that built totems. And when you're you're, look, you're you're seeing an amalgamated form of Native Americans that's put together in someone else's mind and never how you know a distinct group of people would look. And just, you're kind of like denying their you know their cultures by you know by creating those kind of images and um one thing i want to point out once again is like you one of the images that comes out with native americans is the teepee and teepee was used much like a tent is used when you go hunting it's just for moving around but it's not like the permanent thing they always lived in and you know not you know only certain tribes use teepees like you know you can there you can see the wooden structure that is the home of these tribes um, then you have the tribes of, you know, California, the Great Basin, the Plateau, the Pomos, the Nes, Nes Persis, Shoshones, and so forth. Um, the, these peoples were, um, were nomadic hunters. They did mix fishing, foraging, um, and, you know, the, it was a mixture of things that they used to sustain life. One of the more distinct things that we would see using is the word, which I'll show you in this image, of how babies were transported. And later, you know, you know, we have redesigned it, but you still see similar things being used with babies today. And um, the, here you can see distinct images of what their tribe looked like. And I'm sure maybe you've never seen natives dressed that way or with different types of headdresses. But like I said, every society was distinct and unto its own. Now, the Southwest tribes like the Apache, the Navajo, the Hohokam, and the Pueblos, the Zuni, um, you know, it occupied the Southwest. Um, one interesting thing about names, and the Apache allows us to talk a little bit about names. A lot of times the names that we're hearing don't exactly mean what we think they say. Um, those words aren't like the name of the tribe in a sense. A lot of tribes, like the name basically with, is that how they refer to, literally translated as the people. One interesting one is the Apache. A lot of these names are given or documented and used by the Spanish. And when they were um, in the Southwest listening to the Pueblos, they would use the word Apache. Um, and what it really meant was the enemy, because that was the group of people they were, you know, they had different times of um, warfare periods with them. And so they would always refer to them as the enemy in their language, which is Apache, but that's not really the, you know, that's what the, not the Apache would have referred to themselves, obviously. And they had different bands, the Chiricahua, the uh, Mescaleros, and so forth. Um, these people lived in frame houses, wigwams, they, wor they worshipped in kivas, um, they used tobacco, and they also used peyote for religious purposes. And here's some of their buildings, those round things, the, the kivas that they would worship in. And these are their homes. Once again, a lot of teepee in sight. Here you can see different um, uh, images of the peoples and what they looked and dressed like. And the Great Plains. The Great Plains are kind of like um, when, you know, movies and stuff. This is the depiction of, you know, different tribes like the Cheyenne, the Sioux, the Arapaho, the Comanche, and the Apache. Um, their main day of food was the buffalo, um, and they move, when they did move around, they did live in teepee. So these are maybe some of the images you come to, you know, picture in your heads, but like these are in no way, you know, an image for all Native Americans. Not all of them wore headdresses, not all, all of them utilized teepees and so forth. And so, um, once again, like I said, you know, just to use that and say that's an Indian is a denial of their distinctness, their cultures, and so forth. Now, the Eastern Woodland Tribes, um, here we see members of what we would call the Iroquois Nation, which was an amalgamation of different tribes, the Haudenosaunee, Cayuga, Mohawk, and Oneida, Onondaga, the Seneca. These groups um, worked together. They joined together as one. They had a leadership council, and this allowed them to exert control over the area. This allowed them to work together. And this is the example used by the United States when they form, you know, the original 13 colonies into one to fight off the British. And um, Benjamin Franklin even points out that, 
you know, this is where they get the concept from. And the symbol of America with all the arrows tied together was a symbol of the Iroquois nation because the arrows together were harder to break, um, showing their unity. They also lived in long houses, which is an image of here. Um, and they farmed what we refer to as the three sisters, bean, corn, and squash, each one growing next to each other in a way that helped the crops, all of them grow. And there you see an image of what they would have looked like and what they would have dressed like. Um, like I said, everyone distinct to their place and their culture, their tribe, everyone, you know, having very distinct looks to them. And in the southeast, you have um, tribes like the Muscogee, the Natchez, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw. And, you know, and then we'll see the emergence of the Seminole tribes in um, Florida. One interesting thing about when you look at the Seminole tribes is the fact that um, when the British colonies were there and then later America, um, the Seminole tribes lived like in Florida, the southern, you know, the southern part of the United States on, along the East Coast. And, you know, they were very open to anybody and many slaves that actually escaped down and live with the tribe. So a lot of um, Seminole nations have a lot of African blood in them. <laughs> These people were mostly um, lived through agriculture. They had a, a ceremony they had every, once a year. Almost every agricultural group had ceremonies once a year when they brought the crops in. You know, this is where Halloween evolves from. They used to have the green corn ceremony to celebrate the harvest, which they would drink something called a black drink, which was a mixture of like tea and coffee. It was a caffeinated drink. And here you can see some of their settlements. Um, there was, you know, there was different periods of warfare. So they had uh, um, amongst the tribes over resources and more land. And so you can see they use walled cities, kind of like what you would see in Europe. One thing about um, warfare among Native Americans is the fact that um, uh, they didn't like fight large scale battles to, to wipe out peoples. A lot of times they, they just fought to take prisoners. There were limited engagements. It was nothing like you would see in Europe where I'm gonna conquer and you know, wipe out a whole country. It was nothing that ever popped in their heads. Now, one thing about Native American religion Religion to them isn't something that um, you go to church on Sundays, read the Bible, and that's it. They were very spiritual people. Now, like I said, they all had distinct cultures. Uh, in, in generality, we can see them sharing some stuff, when it, especially when it comes to religion. Um, one thing that they, you know, like I said, everything they lived and did was religion. It was spiritual based. They saw everything as interconnected. They saw animal spirits and spirits, the, the earth spirits, tree spirit. Um, they saw um, spirits everywhere. In fact, when they did hunt or they chopped down a tree, they said a prayer to the spirit. They gave thanks, you know, for sacrificing itself so the village could live and so forth. Um, they and they also had a, a concept of one God, a creator God. But the image and look and stuff was, you know, distinct to each tribe. Now, like I was mentioning, um, Native American warfare, very different from um, European warfare. You know, there was usually small scale, short term. Um, they were mostly used to um, capture, to replenish members of the tribe that may have been lost. Um, eventually, some of those members that were captured would be absorbed into the tribe and eventually just be, become part of the tribe. Now, um, Native American culture is also really fascinating because um, it's very different than we look at European culture. To begin with, it's matrilineal, meaning that um, it was more dominant on the on the woman's side. Like if you got if you're a man, you got married to a woman, you went to live with a woman's tribe, not with them. She would not come to the man's tribe. Women own property. Women were deciders, sometimes leaders, or they chose the leaders. Um, and one thing when we use the word chief and leader when it comes to Native Americans is the fact that we're looking, we're using those terms and we're having these images and these thoughts that come once again from this Eurocentric white image. Chiefs were leaders, but they weren't leaders in the sense that we could understand them. They weren't kings or presidents. They were just people that were wise, that people would listen to, that they respected. But in no way, whatever they said was like law that you had to obey. 
they all the whole tribe had to agree on what was going to happen with the tribe. Now that's why sometimes you hear someone referred to as like a war chief or something, but that's because he was a great warrior. He knew great tactics. So when it comes to war, we go to him, you know, and we, you know, we have shamans and we have, you know, general chiefs, like when there's issues and he makes good judgments, we go to him. But in, they weren't in a sense like the absolute power leader or whatever. The tribe decided things as a whole group. They were a very, very democratic peoples, more so than the democracy that was brought over here. So when you look at Native American cultures, you know, understand they were very distinct. Um, they had many genders. Uh, they usually had, um, most tribes practiced with, um, had um, what we call two-spirit persons, someone that was in between, that had roles back and forth or dressed in different, you know, in, in different genders. And this was just commonly accepted. In fact, they were supposed to be very powerful spiritually because they could walk both worlds. In the Sioux, it was actually good luck if you could have a two-spirit person at the birth of your baby and naming your baby. It was actually a great thing. So even when it comes to gender, their concepts were very different than what was being brought over here from the old world. So when we talk about Native Americans and we study Native Americans, you have to understand these are distinct people with distinct cultures and their own form of civilization, but that doesn't make it less of a civilization.